I am Shannon Matthews, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I have the pleasure of giving you a little bit of background on the Foshnod Lecture Series and why we're here, and then I'll hand it over to um, the department chair. The Foshnod Chair of Religion, in, Religion Endowment was created in 1982, and today it supports the Foshnod Lecture Series. The series focuses on issues in society and religion. The Foshnot Chair of Religion Endowment was named after Harold Foshnot, former University of Laverne president, serving his term from 1948 to 1968. Harold received an honorary doctorate of humane letters in 1980. Later in 1986, the Foshnot Chair of Religion at the University of Laverne was created. I would now like to introduce Dr. Elaine Padilla, Chair of Department of Religion and Philosophy, as well as an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion, Latinx and Latin, stud, uh, Latinx and Latin American Studies. Dr. Padilla constructively interweaves current philosophical discourse with Christianity, Latin America, and Latino, Lat, Latina religious thought mysticism, ecological, gender, and race. Dr. Badilla. Good afternoon. Before I introduce Dr. Catherine Keller, our speaker for today, I would like to invite you to take notes and write down your questions throughout the lecture. Once the lecture concludes, Dr. Jonathan Reed will be facilitating a Q&A session. Dr. Reed is a professor of religion at the Department of Religion and Philosophy and recently has been examining the study of Native American religions with a particular focus on the Lakota ghost dance. I wish I could say more because he's a very accomplished scholar, but for the sake of time, I'm going to be introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Catherine Keller. Dr. Keller practices theology as a relation between ancient hints of ultimacy and current matters of urgency. As the George T. Cobb Professor of Constructive Theology in the Theological School and Graduate Division of Religion of Drew University, she teaches courses in process, political, and ecological theology. Within and beyond Christian conversation, she has all along mobilized the transdisciplinary potential of feminist, philosophical, and pluralist intersections with religion. Dr. Keller's book, books, several, reconfigure ancient symbols of divinity for the sake of a planetary conviviality, a life together across vast webs of difference. Thriving in the interplay of ecological and gender politics of process cosmology, post-structuralist philosophy and religious pluralism, her work is both deconstructive and constructive in strategy. She's currently finishing, uh, actually, she already uh, published uh, Face, Facing the Apocalypse, which is her latest um, book. She has also, also authored Political Theology of the Earth, Intercarn Intercarnations uh, on the Possibility of Theology, and Cloud of the Impossible, Negative Theology and Planetary Entanglement, among others. Since the start of the millennium, she has served as Executive Director of the annual Drew University Trans Transdisciplinary Theological Colloquium. These events have yielded 12 anthologies, mostly published by Fordham University Press. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Keller. Good to see you all there, in as much as I can see you. But um, I do see you well enough uh, to say that I am very honored to be here for this Fasnacht lecture and actually to learn why it's called the Fasnacht lecture. I was a little confused because Fasnacht in German is Mardi Gras. <laughs> so I, I was thinking we were going to have a, a very strangely timed, you know, wild celebration, but this is more appropriate. And uh, 
very uh, proud, of course, that uh, Elaine Padilla teaches here and is now a, a leader uh, for her program. Uh, we've worked for a very long time together, and I'm so grateful for that. So, Earth Matters, Generation, Motivation, Eco-Civilization, what's all that? Well, two planets meet. The first one asks, how are you? Not feeling so well, the second answered, I've got the Homo sapiens. Don't worry, the other replied, I had the same, that won't last. Mm. Yeah, maybe that isn't really funny. <laughs> maybe it's in bad taste to joke about our species approaching extinction. But you can see why the Earth might chuckle. On the other hand, if we do not last long due to that eco-self-destruction, that's actually going to be considerably worse for our planet than if we, well, <laughs> get our act together which means together with each other and with the Earth, and evolve onward for a few more thousand, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of years. We could do that. <sighs> Two sides of a very big if. And it is that if that's probably the real topic of this talk. And my point isn't to try to estimate how long we might last or not last, but to meditate a bit with you on the mattering, the earth matter, the matter itself of that if. So in the meantime, as the earth suffers, Homo sapiens is not such a bad name for the disease, is it? But of course we need to be a bit more specific we, the species, are not all to blame, not equally, not nearly, nor do we all or will we all suffer equally the effects of global warming, no more than we all suffer equally now the injustices of the dominant order. Nonetheless, there is no avoiding thinking in species-wide and hence truly planetary terms about both the causes and effects of this worsening condition. But thinking about our species always entails analyses of power, political, economic, racial. The gross inequalities are part of what it is to be homo sapiens, at least in the terms, the long terms, of our civilization this civilization. And so to imagine an alternative, an eco-civilization, means to confront those powers. For those who do the most to cause the climate catastrophe are gonna be the ones who do as little as possible to fix it. So, you know, it comes down to you and to me and those we can influence, multiplied by billions, not then as mere individuals, but as participants in multiple systems, nations, networks. It comes down to us finding ways to keep in mind all our minds in all our times that Earth matters, how it matters, as more than the background of our mattering, exciting lives the background of the issues that preoccupy us. But this is then matter as the active ground of what we are, of what everything is, precisely not in the sense of a boringly mindless matter, a matter at base, inert, lifeless, flat stuff. That's the old materialism of the modern world since Isaac Newton that old, modern, materialist matter has pushed triumphantly into the postmodern, into the current capitalist world as the stuff to be con consumed endlessly. So now, speaking of endgames, we are offered the new materialism 
as a critique of that old version. I'm not crazy about that name, given the ever new, new, new commodified forms of the old materialism. So I think of the alternative perhaps more as new materialization than as new materialism to evoke the active materializing, not just the passive matter or material. But the so-called new materialism does work constructively with the ecological sense of matter that I first internalized actually through the process thought that is so deeply rooted in your neighboring community of Claremont. A sense of matter not as substance or stuff, but as a process, a lively process of materialization, of becoming material, of getting embodied moment by moment. A materialization of that subtle energy that is matter multiplied not just by the speed of light, but the speed of light squared. Unfathomable. That energy that makes us all up, that is the process, the process in its endless events of materialization. Materialization is kind of the opposite of abstraction. Abstrahire, to pull away from. Whereas materialization pulls energy into embodiment. It actualizes the possibilities that would otherwise remain abstract. But abstractions themselves aren't the problem. Uh, but forgetting that they're abstractions is. And so losing the sense of the moment to moment concreteness of materialization. That is at the root of the problem. One of the complex roots of the problem. It's what the process philosopher Alfred North Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness which is something like mistaking the abstract quantities of profit with the concreteness of the quality of life, of human well-being. So that, that old fallacy lets materialism keep putting our materiality in the background where it can be endlessly quantified and commodified then we dissociate the possibilities of, that are still always abstract, but we dissociate them from the future that will materialize from the present earth, a future that will materialize for good or for ill, a future that's materializing in your lives right now that you, in part, select and do so according to what matters to you. Matters in the sense of having value, even what might count for you as ultimate value, since this is a lectureship connected to religion. It has to do also with the matter of ultimate concern, as theologian Paul Tillich put it, what matters ultimately, what matters to you. Call it rightness, spirit, truth, God, goodness, justice, love, the shared life of the earth. It doesn't all come down to a name. That is <laughs> this mattering, what you make matter for the future of your planet. A planet made of this matter that matters, of which we are each and all materializations right now and now, and now. So I want to meditate with you today on how that earth matters in terms of generation, motivation, and eco-civilization. So first, when I talk about your materializing future, I want to pause and take, uh, take into account the significant generational differences here. Some of you, many of you, are students, very young, from my perspective. For you, the future of climate change is no abstraction at all. It is your future. You will likely find out in very personal ways if we reach, as the International Energy Agency says, we must 
net zero carbon emissions by 2050 in order that we are able to stay within the average 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, the global average warm-up since pre-industrial times. The, the limit to a degree and a half that according to the international consensus may, may prevent the extreme and irreversible climate effects that would certainly kick in with two degrees centigrade of the global warming annually. Where are we now? <laughs> well, it's not a memorable number. It's 1.15 degrees centigrade. In May, the World Meteorological Organization issued a report that projected a significant likelihood, 66%, that the world would exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold in the next four years. This breach would likely be driven by human-induced climate change combined with a warming El Nino, a cyclical weather phenomenon that temporarily heats up oceans, region, ocean regions and pushes global temperatures higher. But this threshold does not actually even then need to become permanent. It, permanent. it doesn't need to become permanent. But gener generationally speaking, my point is, the younger you are, the more reason you have to be angry. You will inherit this precarious future which you did not cause. Being in touch with that anger is crucial, I think. It will help to motivate. Anger does not need to get stuck in blame or to burst out in counterproductive ways but it helps to hold responsible, able to respond, those who are older and with more power. And getting in touch with your anger helps to cut through all the excuses. So in its responsible forms, anger will help with transgenerational solidarity. And then the generational differences can become Generative, that word has deep religious resonances. It's related to the word genesis, which means, in the Greek, <laughs> becoming, and is the name for the ancient myth of creation. A story that reminds us of the sacredness of the universe and of the earth. The earth and all the earthlings are not cosmic accidents in this story. They materialize out of an ultimate mattering. And Genesis also tells a story of the greed, the arrogance that gets going so very early in our species. And now that comes to a head in the threat against the very earth and all the other earthlings in addition to us. Genesis itself, the becoming of our world, is at stake. Not the universe or the multiverse. That's all going on <laughs> with or without us. But of our precious mattering bit of it. In the next generation, the Earth habitat will continue to degenerate or it will be regenerated and not I say as a theologian, by a God stepping in at the last minute to save us from ourselves. That is a destructive mythology. Rather, regeneration would come by our collaboration with what matters and with what matters ultimately. I bring in those biblical metaphors not because they contain the truth, but because they can help us to motivate the broader solidarities that are needed. They can help us work on those shaped by those metaphors and misshaped, as so much Christianity is, by tragic misreadings of those texts. Misshaped. 
Christianity has been a major source of our Christianity's, excuse me, <laughs> it's redundant, of our civilization's denigration and exploitation of matter, even of the material bodies of other humans, those considered not to be quite fully human because of religion or class or race or gender or sexuality. A certain kind of otherworldly Christianity which thinks of itself as anti-materialistic, of course, quietly is in league with the old materialism. It undergirds our species' abstractions and extractions from matter itself. It demotivates care for the earth in the interest of higher things. And yet, there are deep traditions of Christian ecology as well rather nicely represented even in this room right now. They draw both on the ancient traditions, particularly in their social critical prophetic forms and on cutting edge science. The theologian, John B. Cobb Jr. already wrote a book called, Is It Too Late? in 1971. Speaking of different generations, uh, and I probably shouldn't mention that he's in the room. It was the first book by a single author on the ethics and theology of the looming ecological crisis, and he recently updated the book for its 50th anniversary. Is It Too Late was ahead of most ecological work in any discipline at all. And his answer to the question wasn't a simple yes or no, uh, then, nor is it now. And this version of faith, sometimes called process theology, is more helpful than straight atheism, a lot of us find, for countering anti-ecological Christianity and for drawing more of the huge global Christian population toward earth solidarity. And by the way, by a lovely coincidence, I so recently learned that uh, John Gingrich, a former dean at Laverne, uh, was deeply involved in the Claremont uh, community of process thinkers and theologians. And uh, I hear you can contribute to the Gingrich Memorial Fund. <laughs> Just uh, Google the Cobb Institute. <laughs> it was process theology that drew me into doctoral work in Claremont uh, <laughs> generations ago. And it was the critique of the standard paternal God that actually hooked me. The process deity takes the place of the old father God and his supposed omnipotence. Process theology sees that God cannot be at one and the same time all controlling and all good, or things just would not be in the mess they're in. Process theology offers strong alternatives to God seen as the puppeteer who controls everything, or God seen as the patriarch who rewards and punishes. The process God is not about control, does not control, but lures. This God calls us to make the needed transformations, calls us to make the needed transformations of ourselves and our collective world before it is too late. Ecotheology, however, is of course much broader than process theology. Already the global ecumenical body, the World Council of Churches, added sustainability to its public commitment to the values of a just and participatory society. So it was at the 1982 Vancouver meeting that the phrase, the integrity of creation, was coined as the encompassing commitment of this World Council of Churches. The phrase signifies that the creation does not exist solely for human purposes. It has its own integrity. This recovers the message of the first chapter of Genesis, that God symbolically called the creatures of the creation, each of them, all of them, good, before 
and apart from the emergence of the human creatures. Of course, the effects of this global Christian eco-solidarity have been disappointingly slow. It was over 40 years ago that I was first drawn into eco-theology. And that, by the way, was not just because of process theology, but also uh, of eco-feminism. And it really has been a while. But the potentiality does persist and does grow for it to be further materialized. And this eco-theological hope is hopeless unless the Christian form of eco-theology works in a broad and ever broader ecumenism. Just for one example, I loved recently uh, taking part in a conference on uh, Islam, Christianity, and the Earth. That was the title. So I learned a lot. Consider the following verse from the Quran. Surely the creation of the heavens and the earth is something greater than the creation of humankind. But most of humankind do not know this truth. So I don't know of any sacred text of Christianity that so directly and pointedly names the whole cosmic context as both greater than the human and for the most part unrecognized as such by the human. Muslim environmentalists, such as in this case, Ibrahim Ozdemir, also stress the following remarkable passage from the Quran. Don't you see that it is God whose praises all beings in the heavens and earth do celebrate, and the birds with wings outspread? Each one knows its own mode of prayer and praise, and God knows well all that they do. So. Mohammed, an early eco-prophet. <laughs> Our Earth home needs the ecumenical collaboration of all the global religions or ways. Note that the ecu of ecumenical is from the same Greek word as the eco of ecology, the word oikos, meaning home. And the resources are here in our home. For instance, Harvard's, there's a whole Harvard series of volumes edited by Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm on ecology and religion. And I'll list some of the volumes. Christianity and Ecology, Islam and Ecology, Buddhism and Ecology, Confucianism and Ecology, Hinduism and Ecology, Taoism and Ecology, Jainism and Ecology, Indigenous Traditions and Ecology, and these are each hefty volumes. You don't have to be religious at all to appreciate the motivating force, the matter, <laughs> the mattering <laughs> of such eco-ecumenics. And I have to confess, I am ever inspired for <laughs> decades by John Cobb's sense that Christ was calling him, it was Christ calling him to become a Buddhist Christian, to empty out of Christianity its all too frequent spiritual egotism, its fixation on personal salvation, its belief that Christ names the only way, and to overcome uh, its indifference to the material health of the work, of the, of the earth this call comes. Then, eco-theology can generate cooperation between religions and beyond religions with concerned secular publics for the sake of our shared material future. So, no matter what religion or irreligion you espouse, a change motivating spiritual solidarity can materialize across manifold traditions and generations. 
it does not mean suppressing your anger, disappointment, and doubt vis-a-vis -vis particular religions, perhaps the one you had too much early experience of. Participating in a broad and growing eco-spirituality requires honesty with yourself and about your feelings, your affects, which is why I brought up the rectitude of anger on the part of younger generations. And fear is another difficult eco-emotion we need to not repress. Repressing fear and anger or even despair, just gets us trapped in them. Emotions are not about getting stuck in one feeling. Think of the word emotion. It's about being moved, not being stuck, not trapped, not reflecting the ancient unmoved mover, Aristotle's and then Aquinas' notion of God, not moved by human experiences, for instance. So, not, uh, so then it is good that process theology envisions instead a most moved mover. Our emotions move us, they motivate action, they can energize new practices, perhaps in the image of that most moved mover, and so move us beyond despair. And it isn't just anger and fear that work to move us, but also joy. It also has spiritual depths. So your own Professor Elaine Padilla called her first book, Divine Enjoyment, a theology of passion and exuberance. Letting the metaphor of God radiate enjoyment makes being created in the image of God something liberating, sometimes even fun, not just virtuous. And so she advocates even for sometimes expressing a carnivalesque passion. <laughs> Speaking of Mardi Gras and <laughs> Fasnacht, these affects can help forge more energetic communities of social action on behalf of human justice and of Earth's healing. Affects of exuberance are not superficial distractions, but energizing connections of each of us to each other. And not just ethical, but erotic connections. And then Elaine Padilla writes, beauty becomes intrinsic to the ethical impulse rather than superfluous, supplementary, subsequent, or lesser than it. When attraction to the beautiful including the beauty of non-human nature, like those multiple gorgeous peaks <laughs> that frame your campus, then, then that attraction works not for greedy, evil, and possessiveness, but for the good. And then there is truly some reason for hope, which brings us to the feeling most at stake, most jeopardized, and most important for our species' future, the motivation of motivations, hope. Some of you, indeed some of my students, quietly dismiss hope for our Earth future. They think it's just too late. Hope is unrealistic, a delusion. If we're talking hope for a future that is not just collectively survivable, but somehow beautiful. Too late? Well, they might be right. We do not know. We do know that there is a significant possibility we will not just surpass that 1.5 centigrade threshold, but going up from there, catastrophically, a real chance. A possibility, however, not a certainty. The point is that unless we know that ecological healing is impossible, that all our efforts are now too little, too late, then we really do not know. That uncertainty, that uncertainty is actually grounds for hope. But 
it is not any reason for optimism. And that is where I suggest we all routinely make a clear and strong distinction. Hope is not the same as optimism. Optimism is the opposite of pessimism. Hope, however, casts its own shadow of pessimism. Hope does not stifle its own doubts. Hope is not optimism. Optimism is an assurance that things will turn out just fine. Optimism is the driving spirit of capitalist progress thinking. Commodify more of the earth, make greater profits, create better technology, it'll get greener, it'll fix everything, guaranteed. Hope, very differently than that progress optimism, stays tuned to its own shadows. It knows that it doesn't have certainty. It knows it doesn't know for sure where things are going. And theologically, hope does not depend on God to step in at the last minute and fix everything, or on a God who doesn't give a damn about the material world anyway, but guarantees salvation in heaven to unquestioning believers. So I'm talking a hope, a deeply biblical hope, that is not a simple belief in miraculous interventions, divine or technological. The spirit of hope keeps luring us to actualize more humanly just and earth healing possibilities. Hope, what is that? It's the embrace of possibility. The embrace of possibility that matters. But hope needs mattering possibilities to embrace potentialities already in part materialized and therefore serving as motivations for greater materialization. So another such example, when I read very recently in The Guardian that the prospects of the world staying within the 1.5 degree centigrade limit on global heating have brightened, according to a big recent study, owing to the, quote, staggering growth of renewable energy and green investment in the past two years, I did feel the brightening. Fatih Birol, executive director of the International Energy Agency, the world's foremost energy economist, said much more needed to be done, but that the rapid uptake of solar power and electric vehicles is encouraging. But B-Roll also noted that greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector, his sector, were still stubbornly high. And that the extreme weather seen around the world just this past year had shown, and had shown at record levels, that the climate was already changing at, quote, frightening speed. So his is a shadowed hope. The shadow doesn't disappear when he says solar photo photovoltaic installations and electric vehicle sa sales are perfectly in line with what we said they should be to be on track to reach net zero by 2050 and thus stay within 1.5 degrees centigrade. Clean energy investments in the last two years, he says, have seen a staggering 40% increase. So such data gives no reason for complacent optimism. Nonetheless, even if it alleviates our pessimism, it doesn't change the fact that the surface ocean temperatures off the coast of Florida reached 110 this summer, hotter, than a hot tub, and so forth. There's another story from recent news, I think you heard, which I don't want us to forget. It tucks our question of motivation right into the theme of generation. It's the story of 16 young people between ages five 
and 22 in Montana. You heard about this? The ones who filed a lawsuit against state officials claiming that the state was not doing enough to protect them from climate change. And those young ones won the case. District Judge Kathy Seeley said that officials violated Montana's highly protective constitution by refusing to consider the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions when they've approved coal mines, oil drilling, and new power plants. Attorneys for Montana argued back <laughs> that the state's emissions were too small to make much difference in climate change. And monumentally, Judge Seeley rejected the argument, saying essentially that every ton of greenhouse gas counts toward global warming, and each ton makes the plaintiff's lives worse as wildfires in Montana get worse and streams dry up from drought. And the judge said very pointedly, the state can do something about it, deny permits for fossil fuel projects. This outcome is being called by legal observers a landmark victory. It does mark the first time a court in the United States has declared that a government has a constitutional duty to protect people from climate change. Really hopeful, and yet certainly no reason to drift into optimism. Much more needs to happen than one state being forced begrudgingly to honor its own regulations regulations better than what a lot of states have. And it's becoming clear that the state is going to appeal the decision to the Montana Supreme Court. But whatever that outcome, the story motivates more actions. A story that an honest hope can embrace. A, co a, a case that in its affects of youthful rage materialized into transformative action illumines a mattering future. It illumines one of many paths, maybe millions of paths needed. And what matters is that these pathways keep intertwining and that the vision keeps materializing no matter what across generations. And that is a vision that some have called ecological civilization, eco-civ for short, a concept grounded in this vicinity, indeed, in the work of John Cobb, who has warned us that it is already too late for a smooth transition, an organic metamorphosis of our civilization into an ecological version of itself. Um, and as the little book by, very nice and readable and little, as the, this little book by process thinkers Philip Clayton and Andrew Schwartz called what is eco-civilization uh, nails it, our civilization, modern civilization, is based on the wrong paradigm the paradigm of control and exploitation that has caused and is causing the crisis. That is the paradigm that keeps matter abstracted from our awareness, keeps our awareness disembodied, floating, keeps us buying in, often just unconsciously, to those fallacies of misplaced concreteness running the global economy, keeping us numb, systemically indifferent, to the matter of Earth. So if the basic paradigm of our civilization has to change, that does mean that we need a different civilization, radically different from this vast system of indifference. And that doesn't mean just a greener version of the present paradigm. Nothing guarantees that such a change will happen we might just go on through a near total collapse of civilization in this century, followed by a pathetic 
few years, maybe a few centuries for the survivors. Or the collapse might be great enough to put us all on notice, but not so great as to make it too late, too late for a new civilization. No matter what, there's going to be some degree of systemic collapse given the mounting fires, the ice melts, the floods, the droughts, the parts per million of carbon dioxide. And the, the collapse will be more apocalyptic the greater the resistance to it. Even so, apocalypse, that ancient word, means literally revelation, disclosure, not closure. Transformative change could happen uh, even on an apocalyptic basis. Eco-civilization, like the ancient vision of the new Jerusalem, the new atmosphere and earth, an atmosphere or heaven and earth holding a radically different kind of urban civilization called New Jerusalem, could emerge, could emerge from the rubble. But with or without those old prophecies, we may hope and so we may insist that the transition already underway be magnified, qualitatively intensified, making possible a much more tolerable transition to a livable future. This civilization could then conceivably morph into eco-civilization without undergoing the worst sorts of collapse of transitional violence and self-destruction. We could conceivably then keep the best of this civilization the responsible, eco-congruent technologies, the protection and renewal of the other species, the, honorary, the honoring of the organic life that we all share, the poetry, the arts, the wisdom traditions, especially the ones that foster pluralism, the achievements of democratic egalitarianism and of social justice, even perhaps of institutions like or something like this one here where these conversations can happen. There might be a trans-apocalyptic hope for the University of Laverne. All of this, all of this would depend on what the French eco-philosopher Bruno Latour calls facing Gaia. You know that word Gaia, an ancient uh, Greek earth goddess. Gaia appears now not as a divinity, but as the earth itself, beyond all our stale notions of nature. Latour writes, we are not stunned spectators witnessing the discovery of a new world to be at our disposal. We are rather witnessing the obligation to relearn completely the way we are going to have to inhabit the old world. We recognize ourselves then in this Anthropocene era as what he calls the earthbound. That's his transcription for uh, humanity. Eco-civilization then, we could say, would be the context of the earthbound in as much as we bind ourselves to that earth boundedness, bind ourselves mindfully, then we find it doesn't diminish, but frames our relations, our organic relations to the rest of the cosmos, to what was called the heavens. So being earth bound isn't cutting us off from the universe. And who knows, in the attempt to materialize ecological civilization, the energy of matter itself, freed from exploitation, as then becoming the energy, <laughs> freed from the exploitation used to power our anti-ecological civilization, that freed up energy may come to our aid in new ways, as in energizing new affects of beauty and community and even hope, affects with 
effects. And so new motivations moving across generations that intensify our earthbound connectivity. So eco-civ isn't exactly a utopia, utopos, meaning no place, literally. We materialize it already, here and there, knowing these beginnings, however modest, have a chance of spreading, of materializing in ways we cannot predict. And we must regularly remind ourselves that we have a goal. And as the authors of what is ecological civilization write, however the goal is named, such a civilization can be built only by people who think first in terms of organisms and ecologies, rather than primarily in terms of machines and individuals. But even with some degree of that hopeful scenario, which I think is not impossible, if perhaps it is improbable, we don't avoid apocalypse. As I said, however, the ancient Greek apocalypsis does not mean shutdown or closure. It means disclosure. The history of the misreading of apocalypse as the end has served the ends of the white Christian right wing all too well. Yeah, if the end of the world is coming soon, what's the point of changing the world or worrying about the environment, right? But the ancient book of Revelation is quite different. It is a surreal set of visions warning in code of the collapse of the Roman Empire, the then form of civilization and the destruction it envisions to both humanity and the rest of the planet is nightmarish, but it is not total. And there arises at the end of that text of the apocalypse, a great new earthbound urban civilization, civis, to be sure, city, the new Jerusalem. Fundamentalists think that it is a supernatural new creation from nothing, just coming down from heaven supernaturally given. Biblical scholarship actually differs. The text is not offering literal predictions, but dreamlike visions. The new city comes down, we can say, in the sense of coming down from abstract possibility into on the ground materialization. And key, the human species will have learned its lesson our lesson. There is envisioned a world civilization of peace and cooperation between the powers. All the rulers of the world ride through the always open gates of the city, and a stream flows through the center of the city, the water of life, and on both sides grows the manifold tree of life. Two thousand years before climate change was imaginable, this and other spiritual traditions imagined a humanity transformed through great crisis into harmony with itself and the rest of creation. Only fundamentalists think this is some kind of guarantee, which then goes nicely hand in hand with secularist capitalist optimism. So oddly, the old metaphor of apocalypse can be a ground for hope centered then in that hope that arose in the ancient Jewish prophetic tradition, a hope shadowed by unthinkable losses. That sort of honest hope may motivate us even in our generations of struggle. And it is, I repeat over and over, not that a deity will step in and rescue us, but that we can, as a species, yet undergo enough transformation while there is still Time enough, time to sidestep the great, too late. Whatever apocalypses we fear and we undergo, always remember that apocalypsis means to disclose, not to close down. Big lessons can be and are being learned from each new ecological disaster even from COVID. Environmental awareness has been 
rising uh, globally. It rose globally. I should put that in the past tense during the pandemic years. And 82% of Generation Z register strong commitments to sustainable practices, 82%. And Gen Z is over 20% of the US population. By the way, I do hate that name, Z. What does that say about the end of the world? What's the next generation after Z? But anyway, the vocabulary is out there. And what Gen Z is committed to matters. These practices will materialize. But this is not to exaggerate hope, not in the sense of utopos, no place. So perhaps we can embrace something of the sense that the word itself, utopia, was coined by Sir Thomas More to capture. It plays on the Greek utopos, EU, meaning good place. And at the same time, another, <laughs> another Greek term, no, you place. So the good place is no place, no actual place. But pause there, maybe not actualized, not anything like really yet materialized, right. But even when you think the good place is no place, nowhere to be found, aren't you hoping for it? Even if you bother, even just say with, with recycling, aren't you a wee bit hopeful this makes a difference? Not some stale, old, and failed hope this, but in the context of the civil rights struggle, uh, James Baldwin had put hope in a time where hope was very hard to sustain for African Americans. He put hope this way. Hope is something that has to be reinvented each day in life by each and all of us now, all of us tired of both the delusional optimisms and the paralyzing pessimisms, all of us translating utopia into the shadowed and ever-shifting hope, the generative hope, the mattering and motivating possibility of earth healing and ecological civilization. But in the meantime, <laughs> the two planet cartoon of Earth's complaint does not reassure us. If Homo sapiens is a sickness the Earth needs to heal from, well, might the disease become our dis-ease, our acute discomfort with our status quo? Might we the species at last take our name seriously? Homo sapiens, sapiens as in sapiential, meaning wise? <laughs> Couldn't we join generations and motivations and actually create eco-civilization? Couldn't we wise up? That would be no joke. Thank you.